Hey, what's up, PGF Nation? Before we jump into the episode, in case you guys didn't know, we had a lot to cover in this one, and it went longer than expected, so we decided to cut this episode into two parts. This is part two. So if you didn't listen to part one that came out yesterday, go back and listen to it first. But here is the rest of the episode. Before we jump into our NFC East division preview here, I thought it'd be fun to pick some of our favorite NFL future bets with the season right around the corner. Time to get those bets in before week one kicks off. Tara, I'll start with you. Who do you like for a future bet this year? If, let's put it this way. If there wasn't such a um, prejudice against uh, defensive players winning MVP, I would say Micah Parsons MVP, but I, I'm going to say Micah Parsons defensive player of the year. That'd be my future bet. I love that bet. And I'm glad that you said it because you brought up Micah Parsons earlier. You got to see him up close in Oxnard for the Cowboys training camp. And this is a guy that I think too is going to be my pick for defensive player of the year. He is a one man wrecking crew. And I could definitely see that being a guy to circle here. He's got pretty much every other accolade. That's kind of the one that's left on the resume. And I think he could do it this year, especially with, like you said, with all the different multiple variations that they're going to put him or formations, I should say, they're going to put him in and all the different ways that they're going to utilize his unique skill set and all the things that he brings to a defense. I love that one right there. I'll tell you my future bet that I love. It's funny because we just got done talking about this team. By far my favorite future bet, Carolina Panthers to win the NFC South plus 400. Too much value to ignore here. The NFC South, I feel like, is wide open. This division might be one of the most wide open divisions in all of football. And when we look back to last year, the Panthers were neck and neck with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for that division title last year. And that was with a total mess at the quarterback position. I like this young defense. I like the playmakers on that side of the ball, especially. I like Frank Reich taking over for Matt Rule. And I really think that Bryce Young, even, even as a rookie, I think he's going to help stabilize that quarterback spot. At plus 400, I love this bet. Well, you know, let, let me add to that, because and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think isn't Burns going to be a free agent after this year? I'd have to look. I, th- I, th- I think he is, and, and if that's the case, he's going to put on a show. So, you know, so, so if you have some spare cash laying around, I don't think that's, I don't think that's a bad bet. For mine, I'm going to go with a guy that I've been touting as one of my favorite, favorite players coming out of the draft, which is Lucas Van Ness, which is plus 1500. I'm going big here. He's not starting, but I think by week three or four, he's going to be pushing to get into that Green Bay lineup with what they're going to be able to see he's going to do on the field. He has a relentless motor and they're going to need pass rushing no matter what in terms of how they're going to play with their running style and wanting to play defense to close out games. I think Lucas Van Ness at plus 1500 is my, is my futures bet. And that, that's 1500 for defensive rookie of the year. I'm sorry. Yes. Defensive rookie of the year. I like that bet a lot, man. Lucas Van Ness is a guy, once again, another one of those guys that Alex and I both really honed in on in April and during the draft coverage, a guy that we're both really high on, and I think he's in a really good situation in Green Bay. Terrell, what do you think about that bet? I think you know that's, that. I think that's a good bet. I mean, because, correct me if I'm wrong, but Van Ness came out of Iowa, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. So, of course, I got to watch a lot of him because, you know, playing against my Gophers. But so, I mean, I think that's a good bet. But do you think that he's going to outplay Keon from the Patriots? Yes, because Keon is going to be on the line. They're they're doing this 3-4 hybrid where they uh-huh. switch into a 4-3. I don't think Keon is going to have the pass rushing attempts that he will like Vanessa is going to have because he's Vanessa is going to play on the edge. So I think he's just going to have more opportunity to have an impact in terms of sacks and those pop plays and numbers that we're going to see. And trust me, Keon White was one of my big time picks in terms of loving the Patriots draft out of Georgia Tech. But I just love Lucas Van Ness. Like he was a guy I honed in on early before the draft even began that he was a guy that I was on that was going to be a high impact person year one. One of the divisions that probably gets the most buzz year in and year out, huge fan bases, the NFC East. This one's going to be a lot of fun here. Maybe the best division in the NFC. 
top to bottom. A lot of good teams, a lot of intriguing storylines. Let's start with America's team here, the Dallas Cowboys. Mike McCarthy, like we talked about a little while ago, put himself on what I consider an even hotter seat this offseason when they moved off of Kellen Moore and he decided to take over the offensive play calling. McCarthy is a Super Bowl champion head coach. Surprisingly, he has a higher winning percentage than Bill Parcells, Chuck Knoll, Tom Landry, and Bill Walsh. Does he get the credit that he deserves? I want to get your guys to take here before we jump into the Cowboys here. Does he get the credit from the media, the fans that this guy probably deserves? And should he even be considered on the hot seat? I don't think that he gets the credit that he deserves because, I mean, look what he did at Green Bay. And you, we all know that when, when you're a coach, you're only as good as your last Super Bowl you know, win or appearance. I, I think that he's a good coach, but when you're in the Cowboys organization and you you know, you're playing for Jerry Jones. There's, there's a very, very short runway. You know, and I mean, they, they had a good season last year until they came up against the Niners, you know, and then, and, you know, the Niners took care of business. So I think, I think he's on, I think he's on the hot seat, you know, and it's not, and it's not anything that he's done. It's just the way that Jerry Jones operate. And, you know, and again, I believe, and this is, this is not insider knowledge, but I think if there's a mess, messed up this year, I think Dan Quinn is the head coach in waiting. Because if that wasn't the fact, you know, why would Jerry Jones make him the highest paid coordinator there is? Because, you know, Dan had opportunities to go other places. But he pulled his name out because Jerry Jones, you know, wanted him to stay. But, yeah, I just I don't think I don't I think that he's on the hot seat. Yeah, I think he, the, he may be overlooked in terms of underrated. And it's simply because when you get handed Brett Favre then to Aaron Rodgers, there's always going to be, well, you always have that guy. You always have that guy. You always have that guy. And, you know, I can really look at Mike McCarthy and Sean Payton in the same light in the sense of Mike McCarthy was there. Was he not the offensive coordinator uh, for San Francisco for a few years? Correct, Harold? Well, he was there for one year. He was there for one year yeah. before he got the Green Bay job, but he was right. there as a probably an assistant or quarterbacks coach. So there's a lot that goes on that goes on there as well. That he just had this great all time great quarterback quarterbacks there, and now he's been given a regular quarterback and a you know what people would say maybe a ten to sixteen at any given Sunday he could be ten to sixteen quarterback and with a expectation from an owner and that star that comes with that so it's even heightened even more and he comes in with the Super Bowl on the resume so then the expectation goes up another notch and so now he becomes this person that looks at as if he's overrated when he perhaps could be underrated in a sense so I think there's nuance to why people may look at him that way yeah Mike McCarthy I I I think he's just a fascinating coach here because I think he is a really good coach. I think maybe he is a little bit underrated, but that doesn't change the fact there's a lot of pressure. And I think moving Kellen Moore and becoming the play caller, I think adds even more pressure on him this year to deliver. And McCarthy made it clear this offseason. He wants to, quote, run the damn ball. And I think it's the right move because we've seen enough games to see that the more you ask of Dak Prescott, the more mistakes he makes. When he throws over 35 times in a game, he's way below 500. 33 or fewer passes, and he's a really above-average quarterback. He's a guy that needs a strong running game to, su to succeed. We've seen this in the past. His best football is when they had a great running game with Zeke Elliott. They have to find a way this season to get back to being a run-first team that plays great defense because – Dak is solid. We know that. He's a good player, but he can't carry this team. Dak last season led the NFL with 15 interceptions, and he did that in only 12 games. So he's going to have to take care of the ball, and I think part of that is taking the ball out of his hands a little more because he also threw two more interceptions in that playoff loss to the 49ers. So he also is going to have to come through in big spots. I've got real question marks about this team, mostly because of him and Mike McCarthy taking over the play con. I think there's some big question marks about this offense. Now, I don't think there's question marks about the defense. We talked about that because I think they should be one of the best groups in the entire NFL. Micah Parsons, the favorite to win the NFL Defensive Player of the Year. Your pick, Terrell, as well. I love it. Stephon Gilmore, I think, was a huge addition to play opposite of Trayvon Diggs on the cornerback spot. Dallas's defense finished second in DVOA in two consecutive seasons. They have talent. 
at all three levels. And Alex talked about it briefly. We talked about it during the draft podcast. Mozzie Smith, I think, was a really solid first-round pick that addressed their biggest hole on defense yes. and is going to help plug the middle. Well, so let me ask you this. So, you know, since you said that, you know, Dak has played well when they had when they were running the ball, again, you know, I mean, is Tony Pollard an every down back? You know, probably not. Does that solve the problem for them? I don't, I don't think that it does unless they, you know, unless they bring somebody else in. Right, and that's been my whole thing. We know we talked off here. We have a we have a, a person that we speak to a lot who swears the Cowboys are going to the Super Bowl. That's actually not a Cowboys <laughs> fan. That's actually a Chiefs fan at that. But he has the Cowboys going to the Super Bowl this year. And I said, I it's something that I can really buy into. I like what they've been able to do with the offensive line. I think they struck goal without even thinking about it in terms of what Tyler Smith was able to do. But there is that part where what is Tyron Smith and what is Tyler Smith? Tyron Smith and what is Tyler Smith? I see, as I'm looking at their depth chart as of right now, Tyler Smith is listed as their starting guard, and we know Tyron Smith has not been able to finish a season. So, where's the depth in terms of what we're looking at if something happens to Tyron Smith this year? And again, I, I've already spoke on how I feel about the running backs. Excuse me, the running back room, I should say. Ronald Jones, I'm not sure how long that suspension is. I actually thought that was a sneaky good pickup, but now with that suspension, I'm not sure. I love the pickup of Brandon Cooks. Brandon Cooks, to me, is very underrated. People think he's injury prone. He is not. This guy just goes to wherever you send him to and puts up a 1,000 yards no matter who's quarterback. It doesn't matter if it's Deshaun Watson or if it's Davis Mills. He's putting up his numbers and doing what he needs to do. And you now have Michael Gallup a year removed from the injury. So now with him, and depending on however you want to put anybody in the slot, because all three of them are interchangeable within the slot, you now have a formidable three-headed monster at wide receiver, probably a top five, top seven Wide, starting wide receiver room. Now this just becomes on Dak and play calling and what they can do. I do have the Cowboys winning this division simply because of history. Like I said, in the last 16 years, no team has consecutively won this division. But I just think this defense is going to suffocate a lot of teams. So I do have them winning the division. So let, let me ask you both this. So with Alex just described as a very, very good wide receiver room, does that tempt Dak to throw the ball more and to, you know, into audible out of some running plays? No, I think he's going to play within. He's going to play within the in the in the system, and not opt out of what Mike McCarthy is calling unless he sees something. I think that he's going to have, obviously he's going to have some freedom, but. I wouldn't be shocked if they, he has short reins on that and they're going to say, no, just go what we're doing if he keeps opting out and making the mistakes that you alluded to previously. I do think they're going to run the ball and lean on the running game to kind of set up Dak for easy completions, a lot more play action, a lot more motion in this offense and trying to find mismatches in the uh, underneath and intermediate levels where Dak really succeeds at a high level. So I'm going to take Dallas as well to win this division. I think that they're the team to be in this division. Nothing against the Eagles. We know how loaded they are, and we'll get to them in just a minute. But since we're on the Cowboys, that's my pick. Let's shift gears here, though, to the Washington Commanders. The Commanders, this is an, uh, an interesting team here because the Commanders are a team that I think really could have gotten into that Lamar Jackson sweepstakes in the offseason, chose not to. They also could have drafted a quarterback, chose not to. They basically told all of us that they're comfortable with 2022 fifth round pick Sam Howell being the guy for this year. It'll be interesting to see what he can do with Eric Bieniemy now as the offense coordinator calling the plays for them. Alex and I weren't very impressed with this draft class. I don't think they did themselves a lot of favors. I didn't see a lot of rhyme and reason to some of the picks that they made. I don't have a lot of high upside guys in this rookie class for them. Obviously, we know guys can surprise. You never know. But on paper, not very impressed. They didn't pick up Chase Young's fifth-year option because he hasn't been able to stay healthy. Ron Rivera, I think, is directly on the hot seat. And I think he's feeling the heat already going into this year because there's some odd comments that have already come out about Eric Bieniemy recently. I think he's feeling that pressure. This feels to me like a transitional season for this team with new ownership now in place. Yeah, you know what? I, I agree with you. And I think that <laughs> I think they had a chance 
improve their roster and they didn't they really didn't do it and i think that also too i think that ron rivera really started feeling the hot seat when they got new ownership you know and and you know and funny because people were saying oh you know they it was the new ownership that brought in uh eric bienny well we know that's not true it was ron rivera who did that even before this was going on but yeah he's made some comments it's hard to number one you it's hard to walk back comments like that what he said about the enemy you know, I'm sure that, you know, that Eric still has some, you know, has respect for Ron Rivera, but, you know, in the back of his mind, he's like, you know, you're putting this out in the press when this should be been kept in-house. So he's lost probably just a little bit of respect, but he's, but, you know, but the thing is that the enemy is coaching for, it's a job interview to be a head coach, you know, one day. And by them not picking up, you know, Chase Young's option, to me, that's a mistake. Yeah, he's been banged up, but, you know, but look at the injuries that he's had. But he still is a good player. He's not a great player, but he's a good player. Somebody's going to scoop him up if they don't, you know, if they don't franchise tag him, which they probably won't. But but somebody's going to pick him up and they're going to add him to a good defense. And I think that's where he's going to flourish. So the commanders to me, they're they're a head scratcher of what they what the heck they were doing. And I I picked them to finish at the bottom of the, you know, at the bottom of the division. We start with Chase Young. I think one of the reasons is they paid both interior linemen and Deron Payne and Jonathan Allen, and you don't want to lock up that amount of money. And plus, Montez Sweat is also going to be a free agent this year. So they're probably looking at putting both of those guys, quote-unquote, pitting them against each other, and both are going into contract years. And what do we know about football players going into a contract year? You usually get their best. So you have your both defensive ends going into a contract year who are both going to be trying to tear the heads off of any quarterback that's in front of them along with that interior, which probably, I think we could probably safely say that's the best interior defensive lineman in the league in terms of the dual effect of Deron Payne and Jonathan Allen together. So I think this defense, which was a top four defense last year, I think they're going to be another top five defense this year. Uh, We talked about the draft and I the draft is decent. It's just that I probably would have taken. I no, I I won't say probably. I definitely would have taken Christian Gonzalez over Emmanuel Forbes. That defense is pretty much set. Everything is really riding on the offense here. And regardless of what we may feel about Taylor Heineke, when he came in for Carson Wentz, this team took off. Right. He's 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 a mediocre quarterback. He probably doesn't is not somebody that probably someone would build a franchise around. But I think for maybe eight to seven million, you probably could have kept him around and made a run and do something similar that the Giants did last year. Talked about my, our most underrated players, and I have Terry McLaurin. This is a guy that was part of that four-pack with Debo, DK, and A.J. Brown. He's the only one of them that has not had a any type of Pro Bowl-level type quarterback or any decent, true decent quarterback. At least Ryan Tannehill had that breakout year with Arthur Smith where he threw for 33 touchdowns and seven, seven interceptions with A.J. Brown. But Terry McLaurin has really been doing this with Alex Smith, Dwayne Haskins, R.I.P. Kyle Allen, and Taylor Heineken, and Carson Wentz. He's, but he yet he's been consistently putting up his numbers without with these guys. What if you went and just maintained Taylor Heineke, and you also we ha- we saw a breakout receiver last year in Jahan, uh, the rookie Jahan Dotson. The offensive line there's a little bit to be desired for, especially on the interior with the with the guards. However, you're getting a healthy Brian Robinson. You're getting a healthy Antonio Gibson as well. So they have a nice two-headed monster. And they also have Jacoby Brissett. So who knows? We know they want to see what Sam Howell can do. But if they get in a situation, I wouldn't be surprised if they see if we see Jacoby Brissett step onto the field. And with Eric Bieniemy calling the calls, and I love what he's doing, he's trying to separate the men from the boys. And I think that's what you should do, if that makes sense. So I, I like the way that the – commanders are constructed i like their skill players i have them coming in third perhaps making a push depending on how the rest of the conference looks they could be a team that could possibly make a push for one of those those uh wild card positions with maybe about eight to nine wins depending on how the rest of the conference looks you know i i will say this alex that i think the thing that's going to could possibly stop them from being a top five defense again this year is the offense because if the offense sputters, you know, and let's say it's Sam Howell, you know, he doesn't doesn't perform as well as they want him to. I mean, and, and you know, again, they do have some weapons. But if that offense is, you know, has a lot of three and out, three and out, three and out, that puts a lot of pressure and a lot of wear and tear on the defense. You know, and, and don't get me wrong, 
Eric Bieniemy is a brain. He knows what the heck he's doing, but these players have to perform for him. And the thing, too, is that now you got players already complaining <laughs> about Bieniemy being too hard. You know, like, wh- what are you complaining about? It's not like he's, you know, it's not like he's grabbing your face mask, you know, and calling you every bad name in the book. He's just trying to get the best out of you. And if they're complaining about that, what's going to happen when they lose one of their first, you know, they, they lose a game or two and the enemy jumps down their throat? Are they going to curl up in the fetal position and cry and call their mom? What are they going to do? Yeah, that story was crazy. You're right. And it's like being coached too hard. It, it just seems like nonsense. There's kids playing on Friday nights right now that are getting coached hard. I mean, that's football. I I didn't understand it at all. Very bizarre, that whole situation. But to your guys' points, commanders were seventh in points allowed last season and third in yards allowed. This is a good defense, and it's a good secondary, a very good defensive line, like Alex pointed out. The defense is the bright spot for this team. If their bet, so to speak, on Sam Howell pans out with the enemy and the defense is a top-10 unit, maybe this team makes the playoffs in a weak NFC. I totally can see that path for them if those pieces fall into place. But with that being said, I don't see them finishing ahead of Philly or Dallas. I I think there's a distinct gap between the top of this division and the bottom. I think they actually finished last in this division. I don't have a whole lot of faith in what they're doing in Washington, even though there are some nice pieces here. I just think there's going to be a lot of change coming in D.C. I agree with you. I'm right there with you. I think they're going to be Last of the division. Let's jump to the New York Giants. Brian Dayball was NFL Coach of the Year last season, and it's hard to argue with. With After what he did in New York last year, Daniel Jones took a nice step forward last season. His interception percentage was the best in the NFL, really did a great job taking care of the football win. That was something that plagued him before Dayball came in. He was a guy that was turnover prone and cost the Giants a lot of games because of it. I love the improvement I saw from that standpoint. Now, they have a new tight end they brought over, of course, from the Raiders, Darren Waller. I think he could help this offense tremendously if, as long as he can stay healthy. We know that's kind of been his issue recently. If he can stay healthy, I think he has the potential to be a big-time player for this offense and a go-to player for them. The offensive line has been terrible since Jones was drafted. That's been a big weak spot for them, but With two top 10 picks, Andrew Thomas and Evan Neal at tackle in recent years, it started to show some improvement last year. Saquon Barkley, we know, signed a franchise tag after a great bounce back season, but he's another guy. Can he stay healthy? We've seen a lot of injuries in his early part of his career. I have my doubts that he can stay healthy. He's going to be pivotal to their success this year, especially on the offensive side of the ball. I think that they, I think they finished third. Because I like, you know, again, I like what Dayball did last year, you know, and, you know, we talk about Saquon Barkley trying to be healthy. I think he's going to be more healthier this year because of the scheme that Dayball runs. Even though they don't have a lot of weapons on the, I, I consider on the wide receiver front, I think that the way that Dayball coaches and the way that he's going to do certain things. I think that Saquon's going to be healthy. I think they're going to be a better team than they were last year. And you're right, Darren Waller, that addition right there is going to help them. But again, you know, let's, I mean, hopefully, you know, he can stay healthy. But I, I think that they make, you know, they some more positive steps this year, and they're going to, they're going to finish third in the division. I think they're going to give, I think they're going to give every team in that division a run for their money because just because of the way that Dayball coaches, he coaches them like they're men. He's a player's coach. He's not a coach that's going to go in there and start to scream and yell and demand certain things that's not within your skill set. So I, 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 again, I'm not a huge fan of the Giants, but I give them the respect that they're going to play better than they did last year. So looking at the roster, so let's just talk about the weapons. You know, they kept Isaiah Hodgins, who was a guy that came on and was a practice squad guy that Brian Dayball brought over and was part of the the run that got them to the playoffs. They're starting Darius Slane. They got another former number one pick, uh, former bust number one pick, Paris Campbell out of Florida State. They got Jalen Hyatt, the burnout of Tennessee. They have Sterling Shepard. I like the offensive line, the two ends in terms of Evan Neal, Andrew Thomas. Terry, you could probably tell us more about John Michael Schmitz. I think he was the second rated uh, center behind 
Pittman, the center that the Jets draft. I believe he was second. Yeah. So the, I like I like the offensive line. I think the offensive line is solid. However, offensively, everything that we talked about offensively rides on health. So Paris Campbell's been oft injured when he was with the Colts. Darius Slayton is a person that fell out of favor and then got injured with the previous coaching staff. Isaiah Hodges is a guy that showed his worth last year. Sterling Shepard, who is actually one of the better receivers, probably the best receiver on the team on paper right now. He's not even in the start. He's not even starting right now. He's second string. And Jalen Hyatt, we don't know about. And Saquon and Darren Waller, we're worried about them being healthy. There's too much of an health issue with a lot of the players that are going to need to be present for them to make another run, which is why I have them finishing fourth. I do think that the defense can probably be better. They were ranked uh, in the bottom, and I I think they were ranked 23rd last year. But if you're giving me a healthy Kayvon Thibodeau for the year, you have Deontay Banks, even though I've criticized Deontay Banks for getting torn up for 254 yards by the first round pick by the Chiefs, Rasheed Rice, but that's not the hint of them being petty. So, <laughs> but him, Adoree Jackson, Xavier McKinney, that defense can be a lot better. They also finally really brought in a middle linebacker, Bobby or Kirkery, I believe, from Indianapolis, who's a solid middle linebacker. And the strength of this defense to me, which is that offensive, excuse me, that defensive line was led by Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams. And now they added Ashawn Robinson as well. So I think they can do some things defensively and improve defensively, but there's simply too many questions. And now, as one thing we know about this league, defensive coordinators only need a year of to see what it is that you do. And now for them to try and defeat what you've been doing successfully. And because this offense is going to be limited because of the type of weapons that they have, unless we're talking about Darren Waller returning to full form, there's going to be a lot to be desired to see what they can really do. So let, let me add a couple things to that. So you have to give Brian Dayball some credit because he is very creative. So, and he knows, I mean, he's been in this league long enough to know that you have to change some things up. We, we know it's going to be between Washington and the Giants who's going to finish last, and I think it's going to be Washington. There's already turmoil with inside Washington right now, and the season hasn't even started yet. So again, just imagine what's going to happen when they lose a game or two, how that's going to be, where Dayball has, has steadied the ship with the Giants. They believe in him. They believe in the coaching staff. You know, they, they believe in the pieces that they brought in. My my disclaimer here is that one of my guys is actually now the, the assistant special teams coach, Mike Adams. We call him Pops. He brings a whole different flavor to them as well. So, again, it's about chemistry. It's about believing in the people that you're playing next to, and it's about believing in the coaching staff. That's why I think the Giants are going to finish third. Now, that's the, I will, you know what? That's a very good point. I always harp on coaching and the fact that you brought the term out. That, that is a point. That is a point that I really didn't put into the equation. But I'm still I'm I'm going to stick with the Giants finishing last. But that's a great point. Doggone it! I didn't change your mind. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a great point too because it's a small sample size with Brian Dable as a head coach. But we did see some of the things he did as an assistant and as an offensive coordinator. He's got a pretty good track record in a great first year, and I think they are moving in the right direction. I wanted to talk briefly about the defense before we shift gears here because. The defense was below average, and I think it's fair to say that they need to improve on that side of the ball. But I like some of the key young players that they have. Alex mentioned some of them. I think some of these guys are real building block players. Dexter Lawrence, one of the best defensive tackles in the game. Kayvon Thibodeau, the second half of the season, really started coming on strong. Aziz Ojolari is a guy that I think gets overlooked. A really good edge defender, pass rusher. Xavier McKinney, a young safety that I think yep. they can build around as well. I also like their first-round pick, Deontay Banks. And Alex and I, we talked about him once again during the draft coverage. Big-time athlete. I mean, huge speed, can really cover a lot of grass. I think he's a guy that's going to improve that secondary. They have a brutal schedule. And, and this is what really hurts the Giants. We talked about it way back when in the offseason when the schedule release came out. This is a team that got hosed by the NFL with their schedule. I mean, it is brutal. And they play in a tough division. They won a lot of close games last year. So I wouldn't be surprised if they take a step back this year. 
But for Giants fans and to some of the things that we've talked about here, it feels like the first time in a long time they really found the right coach and the right GM and could be building something. So even if they take a small step back, I think they've got to be excited if you're a Giants fan in the direction they're heading. And I also think they had one of the best drafts in the entire NFL. And just to jump back to one quick point here, um, the center they drafted, John Michael Schmitz. Gopher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Alex and I had him as the number one center in this class. I know some yep. people had other guys ahead of him. I think he was the best center in this entire class. I think that was a home run pick. I know, Alex, you really liked his tape too. So that's a big pickup. And Jalen Hyatt and some of these other guys that they got in the later rounds, I, I think they added some young talent to this team. I like the direction they're headed, even if they are – behind the top of this division. And we know the very top of this division, of course, last year was the Philadelphia Eagles. We didn't know what Jalen Hurts was going to be. I mean, let's face it. He went into a make or break type of season. The Eagles didn't even know if he was the guy. It was a big time put up or shut up year. And he showed massive improvement. We know this guy was one of the most improved players in the league. They had that narrow Super Bowl loss to the Kansas City Chiefs. Now they lose both offensive and defensive coordinators this offseason, plus several key players because of salary cap limitations. They lost Javon Hargrave, Miles Sanders, offensive lineman Andre Dillard, Isaac Samalo, linebacker TJ Edwards, safeties Marcus Epps, and Chauncey Garner-Johnson. A lot of key guys from that NFC Championship team that are not going to be on this team this year, but the Eagles roster is still loaded. It's still one of the best in the NFL, and they've gotten younger with some really good draft classes. But what do you think about the changes for this team and going forward this season? I think the Eagles are going to win the division again uh, just because, and I know that Alex is you know, going back on history, but it seems like with them, they, they, they make the right draft picks. Especially on defense, yeah, you know, we again, you know, you you brought up they, they lost some key people. There's there's no doubt about that. But you know, they still have Jalen Hurst. They brought in DeAndre Swift. You know, if Rashad Penny can stay healthy, the person that I think is underrated, Kenneth Gainwell. I think he's you know because I think he can do a lot of things. But you know, but he's, right now he's third. He's third on the depth chart. But I see him moving up. You know, and of course they have AJ Brown and Devontae Smith. To me, sometimes the person that makes the motor go on that is Dallas Goddard. So I think that, you know, with all those weapons, I think they win the division again. But, you know, you look at their <laughs> you look at their defense, it's pretty stacked. They're 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 pretty good. The thing that may hurt them though is the Super Bowl hangover. You know, playing all those games, getting to the Super Bowl, you know, their of course their offseason was was shortened a little bit, right? You made some good points. They lost both coordinators. You know, let's see, you know, what their coordinators do. But again, with all that talent, I still think that they win the division. So do have Philly taking a step back, won the Super Bowl hangover. Yes, but even though that team, they did lose Javon Hargrave, but you gained Jalen Carter. You know, so you lost, they lost the all the line, they lost both linebackers, TJ Edwards is his name, and they lost the other line, Alex Singleton, I want to say. They lost both linebackers. You do now have... Nicobe Dean stepping up, so they're that they're going to be weak at the linebacker position. But however, if you have that strong front four, and also losing C.J. Gardner Johnson and Marcus Epps, who were two starting two starting players in that defensive backfield as well, there and then you losing the coordinators. Now they lost Shane Steichen. Yes, but however, Nick Sirianni is an offensive coach, so maybe he can fill in and do some things there. But they lost Jonathan Gannon and. What a lot of people didn't know who else was on that defensive staff that and I've been talking about him and lauding him when talking about the Miami Dolphins, Vic Fangio was also part of that defensive staff as well. So his input, along with Jonathan Gannon leaving, there's going to be a little bit of that. They're going to take a step back. Furthermore, and you mentioned it, Terrell, when I look at that depth try and to uh, your credit, Kenneth Gainwell actually did now move into second on the death chart ahead of Rashad Penny. But getting DeAndre Swift and getting Rashad Penny, though bodies, though guys that were looked at as guys coming out, both have underachieved and or been hurt. Now, Miles Sanders, he may not have looked like the guy that he was coming out of Penn State. However, but when he he had a lot of production when he was healthy, unlike the two guys, Rashad Penny and DeAndre Swift. 
So these two guys, that running game, which allowed a lot of what Jalen Hurts was allowed to do, even though Jalen Hurts is also part of that running attack as well. I don't know if they're going to be able to see, get the, he's going to be able to get the looks and offensively do a lot of the things that they were able to do. And also with defensively, with the defensive play calling, again, I'm going to mention Vic Fangio, even though he was not the DC, he was part of that staff helping Jonathan Gannon along, but both of those guys are now gone. Even though they may have the talent and the depth as well, I can also see the defense taking a step back from what, I think, what was it, uh, seven guys that had 10 or more sacks or something like that. The, this, this team is just simply going to take a step back. Who is their defense coordinator now? Sean uh, DeSacy, is that how you pronounce his name? And where, where, where did he come from? Seattle. Yeah, so, yeah, so he was the associate head coach slash D coordinator there. And who do they replace Vic Fangio with as being the senior assistant? Matt Patricia. So they kind of fill that gap there because we because Matt Patricia is a good defensive coordinator. He's a good brain. Is he a good head coach? Probably not. Is he a good offensive coordinator? Probably not. You have to give them credit that you know Nick Sirianni went out and filled those holes. You know, and it's not going to be what it was last year. It could be better with a with a different twist. Because I always feel that if you bring in somebody else who has, who's thinking outside the box or who's not thinking with inside the organization, that they could be a little bit more better, a little bit more dangerous because they bring in a new perspective to that. So let, let me ask you, because I know you have another question. How do you feel about them now moving from a 4-3 to a 3-4, but lacking the linebackers? So, they, so apparently they saw something to move to a 3-4. And I believe that what they have there as far as their players go that they're going to be fine with a three four they, they got miles jack right and i think that you know of course you know with fletcher cox there you know josh sweat I, I like josh sweat a lot but nolan smith that to me right there and they have him listed you know what second on the depth chart behind hassan oh, riddick yeah yeah so you so you can unleash those guys but also too i think what they what you may see them do is it could be like I won't call it the NASCAR package, but I think you can see a lot of different packages where they're going to bring be bringing people in and out just to get them breathers, you know, and then making you know they're going to bring in players that are more fresh than than anybody else. So that right there to me makes it makes them dangerous. Yeah, and I think this team's going to be multiple. I think we're going to see a lot of different fronts and a lot of different schemes from this defense. It's it's not going to be a set three, four or a four, three. I think we're going to see them coming in and out of a lot of different packages, a lot of different looks. It's interesting because with all the changes, can they put it all together again? We know the roster is there, but there is a lot of moving parts here. And I'm with Alex here. I think because of it, they take a step back. Now, how far of a step? I don't know. I think they're still going to be pretty good. I think this team was really good last year. But the thing that seems like nobody talks about is they benefited from a really weak <laughs> schedule last year. Yeah. And it seems to kind of get overlooked because they made this run to the Super Bowl. We kind of just forget that they beat up on a lot of mediocre teams. This year, they play out of the division the Bills, 49ers, Jets, Dolphins, Chiefs, Browns, Seahawks, Vikings, and the Patriots, who I think, like we talked about, should have a top five defense. I can't see them not taking a step back. Now, I think they're going to be good. I think they're going to be a good team. I just don't think they're a 14-3 and three Super Bowl team this year. I think they're a lot closer to a 10-win team, maybe an 11-win team that's still in the playoff mix, but I just cannot see them being the same level of team that we saw from the year before. So let, so let me ask you both this. Do you have more confidence in Jalen Hurts or Dak Prescott? For me, it's Hurts, and man, I never thought I'd say that because I didn't believe in this guy at all coming out of college. I thought he was a backup at best. I'll, I've said it on this pod several times. I was definitely wrong about him. Going into last season, I was the one saying, look, this is a make-or-break year. He has to put up or shut up, and he did, and he took that huge step that I just did not see coming. Can he take another step? That's the big question here because – as good as he was last year, he's still a better runner than he is a passer. And running quarterbacks don't age well. 
So I still think there's some room to improve as a passer. Now, with all the work this kid puts in, how serious he takes his craft, and the improvement we've seen from him as a passer, I'm not going to bet against him. That is for sure. Well, you know, also, too, you got to look at, you know, their new office coordinator is Brian Johnson, who was their quarterback's coach for the past three years. So he has a good relationship with, with Jalen Hurts. But, you know, but, you know, you go back to look at the schedules, you know, so I just clicked on the Cowboys schedule. You know, their schedule is not that easy as well, you know, because they have both New York teams to start with. Then they play the Cardinals. Then they play the Patriots. Then they play the Niners. Then they play the Chargers. Then they go Rams, Philadelphia, the Giants. Carolina, Washington, Seattle, Philadelphia, Buffalo, Miami, Detroit. So it's going to be interesting to see how they both perform. But when it comes down to a winning drive, are you going to put your more money on Dak? Or are you going to put it on Jalen Hurst? Because I think some of these, I think you know, a lot of these games are going to be close. So I think, I think that's the that you have to look at. Go ahead, Alex. I think they are too, but I'm going to put more trust in Dak, and I'm going to tell you why. I think he has his wide receiver core is better because I, I don't want to discredit Dallas Goddard. Dallas Goddard is a very good and overlooked tight end and safety valve that he had that uh, Jalen has. But a lot of what he did to A.J. Brown was a lot of 50-50 balls, and a lot of that came off of single coverage because they had to protect against the run. And because that run is not going to be there, I think we're going to see him throw the ball a lot more than he did the previous year simply because that running game is not going to be as strong as strong as it was last year. So if I just take a quick look at what they did last year. So last year, 536 attempts passing versus 544 rushing. They're going to have more passing attempts than they are than they are rushing attempts. I think they're going to have to throw more simply because the running game isn't going to be the strength of it. So he so with that Jalen Jalen Hurts took 460 of those attempts. I he's going to get over 500 this year. Okay. So it's going to be interesting to see what he does when he has to really drop back and throw some of those darts. I'm going to stick with my pick, but and I just thought of something else that may put Dallas more of an advantage. I think Dallas's defense is probably going to be better than the Eagles' defense, and I think when it comes to when they need a big play. I think Dallas' defense will deliver probably a little bit better than the Eagles, but I'm still sticking with my pick because I don't like the backtrack. In a, in a big spot, in a short period of time, Jalen Hurts has already shown that he's a better big game quarterback than Dak Prescott. I, I don't think it's even close. But I'm with you. I think the Cowboys' defense could truly be elite. I think the, I think the Eagles' defense will be really good, but I think Dallas' defense will be elite, and I think that's what separates it for me. We're going to have you on again, Terrell, because this has been truly been so much fun to have you as a guest co-host today talking about all this diff- all these different NFL topics. But guys, that is going to do it for today's episode. I want to give a special thanks to our guest, Terrell Jones, who once again is the head of sports strategic partnerships at Flex Power and a former NFL strength coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and San Francisco 49ers and also an NFL insider. <laughs> Guys, this has been an absolute blast. Terrell, thank you again for coming on the show. We are definitely going to have to do it again sometime. Guys, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. And any time that you want to have me on, I mean, especially when the season starts, I would love to come back and and talk more about it. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Pint Glass Football Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Twitter at PGF Podcast.